Sup y'all, D Snides here, to give you the gist of what you need to know about the 2020 AP Human Geography exam. Now before we begin, I would like to credit everyone you see here. I have been fortunate enough to be teaching AP Human Geography since it came out in 2000. Additionally, I'm one of those lucky readers who gets to look over and score your essays, and I've been doing that since 2005. Now, this is a very incomplete list of people whom I've worked with and I've learned from over the years, and a lot of what I plan to share with y'all comes from those valuable collaborations. So I'm going to be starting with some essential information about exam dates, the exam format, what you need, what units will be on the exam, as well as some advice on not using notes and maintaining academic honesty. But if you want to skip to where I get down to brass tacks about FRQ writing, I have timestamps down in the description. And I would recommend writing a lot of this down. Okay, now think of this video as your GPS, your map app. I can point you in the right direction, but you need to walk the path. In this case, you need to write the essays. Now, if you'll allow me to continue on with the analogy, on the day of the exam, you may come across some speed bumps when you're writing your FRQs. I mean, after all, you cannot predict everything that you're going to see. I'm just trying to prevent you from hitting any roadblocks, and in this case, any writer's block. So when is the exam date? As you can see, it will be Tuesday, May 12th, and if you're talking about Eastern Standard Time, it will start at 4 p.m. If you're at Central, it will be 3 p.m., and so on and so on. You will need to log on around half an hour prior to the start in order to access the online testing system and set yourself up. College Board will send the link to your email, so do not be late. There will be a lot of nerves on that day, so be early and be prepared. So what if you can't make it on that date or what if something strange happens? Well, there is a makeup date. So that will be Monday, June 1st, and that will be starting around 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, coming up pretty soon, maybe sometime in late April or early May, College Board should have a simulated online testing site available. So we can see for ourselves and practice when that time comes. In the meantime, y'all need to be practicing on your own. Prepare as you would the day of the exam and organize your space. So what is the exam format? Now, I will get into more detail later on, but it will be two FRQs, two free response questions. You will have 45 minutes writing time plus five minutes to upload your work after each FRQ. So here's what this means. Question one that is worth 55% of your overall score will have two stimuli, a table, a chart, a graph, an image, an infographic, a map, or some kind of landscape. Now, you will have 25 minutes to read and respond to question one, and then you'll have five minutes to upload your response. After uploading the response to question one, you will have 15 minutes to respond to question two, that is worth 45% of your overall score, which will have one stimulus. And then you will have five additional minutes to upload that response. Important to note, once you have uploaded either response, you can't go back to it. So if you have time to look over your work, do so. And as far as we understand, as long as you have started the upload process, you should be able to move on to the next question. Of course, if you are approved for extra time, that will be factored in for you. Now, there will be a visible timer on the screen during the exam. And students will be able to scroll through the stimuli and the question if needed. Now, I'm unsure if the FRQs can be printed, so check AP Central for more updates. Now, what do you need to take the 2020 AP Human Geography exam? Preferably a reliable laptop, and one that you have used extensively. This is not the time to be trying out new equipment. You went into battle with an unproven rifle. You may use multiple devices if you want. So for example, you could have the prompt on an iPad and write the essay on a laptop. From the advice, less is more. Now, if you so choose, you may handwrite your essay and upload the pics. If you have poor handwriting, this is not the option for you. Just be grateful you can type. Just keep in mind, no matter what you do, you will need to send your essay to the device where you opened the exam. So I do recommend that you have a flash drive available as a backup just in case. Now, which units are on the exam? As you can see, one through five. The focus of the questions can be on thinking geographically, population and migration, 
cultural and political geography, as well as rural and agricultural geography. So what about units six and seven on cities and urban geography and industrial and economic geography? Well, they will not be the focus of any FRQ specifically. So should you just forget about those? Well, the short answer is no. Now, if you have learned this information, great. You can still apply your knowledge of these concepts if you want to. This graphic here should show you what I mean, and I want to credit Seth Dixon, professor at Rhode Island and chief reader for human geography for this concept. In a little bit, I will show you where you can find the essential knowledge of the course, but as you can see, units one through five are testable and six and seven are not. But remember, you can use any knowledge you have if it is applicable. Each FRQ will be based in a primary unit plus at least one point within the question will be drawn from another unit. Also, each FRQ will be drawn from a different primary unit. So for example, if question one is on political, you're not going to see political as the focus on question two. Most, if not all of the units one through five will have at least one point in the FRQs. Also, points can also come from unit one. Now this was not the case before the redesign. So be aware of that. All right, now, is the exam open note? Well, yes, since it will be online and you very well may be taking the exam from home. Now, this may sound awesome, but beware. In my experience, most students score worse on open note assessments. And this has a lot to do with psychology. Now, many students figure that they don't need to study as much since they have all these resources available to them, but you would be wrong. You still need to study a lot. Do not forget the strict time limit. From start to finish, you have 45 minutes plus the upload time. So do not rely on notes. Do not rely on your text or the internet. The questions are going to be designed so you can't just look up the information on a Google search. So don't even try. Now that brings me to my next question. Should you cheat? You kidding me? Don't even attempt to commit any degree of academic dishonesty. Now you should have a solid enough moral compass anyway, but the college board software will authenticate you to detect for any impersonation. So you may have a series of questions that you must answer and that you should be the only person who really knows. Also, they have plagiarism detection software. So do not phone a friend, do not work in groups because exact or similar answers can get flagged. Now, if you are caught cheating, it will be reported to any school where you send SAT or AP scores and reports will be kept on file. So cheaters will likely lose and likely lose big. You will lose. And if you're still not convinced, just read this statement from College Board. At a minimum, test takers should understand that those attempting to gain an unfair advantage will either be blocked from testing or their AP scores will be canceled and their high school will be notified, as will colleges or other organizations to which the student has already sent any college board scores, including SAT scores. And they may be prohibited from taking a future advanced placement exam as well as the SAT, SAT subject tests, or collab assessments. Okay, so what do you actually need to know for the exam? Well, if you haven't already, you can download the CED, the course and exam description from AP Central. Now, among other things, the only terms and concepts that can be tested on are found here. Now, I know you should have a good textbook, but remember, that is only one source. The CED is the course. To quickly break it down, you can see here the very first topic of the course, 1.1. And just in case you're curious, there are 68 topics for the entire course. And since units one through five are the focus this year, there are 49 you should definitely look over with a fine tooth comb. Now, real briefly, each topic has an enduring understanding. Just as it sounds, these are things you should understand. Each topic also has one or more learning objectives. These are things you should be able to do, so think skills. And lastly, there is the essential knowledge, the EKs. These are all the terms and concepts you need to know. Once again, any term or concept not in the essential knowledge will not be the central focus of any part of your FRQs. Okay, now I realize that was a double negative. So to rephrase, the main parts of the FRQs will only focus on the essential knowledge, the EKs. Now listen carefully to what I said. The EKs will be the central focus for testable material. However, 
Other ancillary information can, of course, be used to answer the question if applicable. Now that's why before I said you could use urban or economic information as long as it works. Now, another caveat is if you download the CED from AP Central, that section will run you over a hundred pages, but no worries. You can go to my site, www.decentnods.com, click on AP Human Geography, and on the left-hand side, I have a link to a nice, concise PDF file that's only 19 pages. It's free of charge, so you're welcome. Also, while you're there, I have a big compendium of terms and definitions that I'm still updating, uh, and also you can find a nice summary of the key geographers and models for the course. Okay, so here's what my condensed topic list looks like. Keep in mind, this is not the entire CED. For now, let's focus on the essential knowledge, the EKs. Learn and understand all terms and concepts. It's what I call the geographic jargon. Now, I only say that facetiously. They are all extremely important. You need to know how to define all the EKs, and this is reciprocal. See, if you see the term, you should be able to define it in your own words. And if you see a definition, you should be able to identify the term or concept. Also very important, you absolutely need to know real world examples. And this is one of the hardest things for students to do. So know examples of what something is and what something is not. Remember, real world application. Just because you know a definition doesn't mean that you necessarily know how to apply it to real world situations. Also key is to know examples from multiple places, from around the world. Try to learn examples from places that are quite dissimilar from each other. You know, by this point, you should know that there are big differences in the development between Western Europe and West Africa. Even if you don't know specific data from countries in those areas, understanding regional trends will help a great deal. And lastly, think of examples at multiple scales, if applicable. The three key levels are local, national, and global. Now, regional scale is also a thing, but honestly, you can apply regional analysis to any scale. It's really just a matter of categorization. So for example, if you're thinking about regional scale and we're talking about the national scale, well, I'm here in the Southeast, that's a region. Or if you're talking about a global scale, we can talk about North America as being a region. Now, knowing the terms and the concepts will only take you so far because every part of the FRQ will require you to perform a task based on a thinking skill. So as you can see here on the actual CED, they have the thinking skills categorized and defined. So you will need to apply your knowledge to concepts and processes, spatial relationships, data analysis, source analysis, and finally, scale analysis. Now, I can guarantee that all of these skills will be represented to at least some degree and at some point between the two FRQs. Now, the percentages below each category represent how often you will need to apply that skill across both FRQs. And if you want to see all the possible skills that you can be tested on, here they are. Now, I don't want to overwhelm or confuse you. As you have been taking the course, you've worked on all these skills at some point or another. Now, I will get into the categories a little bit more, but for now, let's move on. Okay, before you write anything, there are a number of things you should think about. First off, who is your audience? Now, you may say an AP reader. Now, that's who's scoring your essay, but we are not your intended audience. So, who is? An educated bum. Now, hear me out. This is somebody who is knowledgeable of general information, but unknowledgeable of your specific topic. So as the writer, you must convince the reader that you know what you're talking about. Be sure to read all parts of the question carefully. Make sure that you are specifically fulfilling the tasks you need to. Also very important is to quickly yet carefully analyze the stimulus or stimuli. Remember, it can be a table, chart, graph, image, infographic, map, or even a landscape. The first thing you should do is look at the title or the caption, if there is one. Now, for these stimuli from a past exam, obviously, you're looking at Germany and Japan. Now, only analyze what you see. Avoid trying to interpret something that is not evident. College Board will not try to trick you, okay? They won't purposefully include any diversionary information, so anything in the stimulus can be useful. In the case with maps, look for any key or legend. 
There's really not much right here to show you, but for this map, you can see the legend shows you the population density, shown in people per square kilometer. And also, look for the scale. Remember, in geography, truth is often scale dependent. Notice the scales on these two maps are different. Germany is a larger scale map compared to Japan. That knowledge could potentially be important. Each question will have a stem, a lead in sentence or sentences. Now, some students make the mistake of not paying attention to this. It may provide key background information, location, time period, etc. So for this question, it states, political geographers classify most countries as either unitary states or federal states. So now you know that this is a political geography question. Each part of the question will be labeled A, B, C, and so on. Now expect each question to be scaffolded. What that means is that the different parts will likely be of varying difficulty. Now I'll talk about that in just a moment. Be aware that one or more parts may have two distinct questions. So there could be paired parts. So look at letter B. If you're reading along, it says explain one positive and one negative impact of a unitary system. Now this is also key. You receive no credit for just restating information from the stimulus or from the question. I mean, if there's no value added, you're not gonna get any points. However, it is smart to use the data, information, or language provided. Okay, one last comment on this. Every FRQ was going to have seven points, but for 2020, there will be fewer tasks in order to deal with a shorter exam time. So that means that there's going to be fewer parts per FRQ. Now, how many will there be? We just don't know. Just be aware that there will be less than seven. Now let's talk about answering the actual FRQ. Notice the task verbs. They will very likely be the first word in each sentence. Each point on the rubric will have a single task from a single skill that I mentioned earlier on. Very important, identify and define will not be on the 2020 FRQs. We're talking about higher level thinking skills. Now remember, they're not going to be asking about anything that can be easily looked up on a Google search or looked up in a textbook. Let's cross out those task verbs on this question. Now, what will you be asked to do? First up is describe, where you will need to provide the relevant characteristics of a specific topic. So you need to provide details and or an authentic real world example. Generally, you should write multiple sentences, so you need to be specific. As you can see, part A would not be asked on this year's FRQs, so how could we convert part A to a described task? Well, here you go. Describe one characteristic of a unitary state. So you could write about a highly centralized government, a strong capital city that exerts power over all of its borders. And if it helps, you can provide an example. So in this case, Japan is a unitary state. You can also expect to explain meaning to provide information about how or why a relationship, process, pattern, position, or outcome occurs using evidence and or reasoning. Okay, so what does all that mean? Provide an identification plus the result. Now more to the point, provide an ID with sufficient details and then explain how or why a result occurred. Now, do you know what a sage is? Someone who is very, very wise beyond their years? Well, we can also use it as an acronym. So, explaining requires specific analysis of a geographic example. Now, you can also think of this as maybe spatial analysis, but specific analysis of a geographic example. Remember, for describe and explain, include details. My advice is to be as specific as you're confident with and as vague as you feel you can get away with. So look at part C. Explain one reason why some countries are governed as federal states. Now, especially if you're stuck, and to help you get the ball rolling, you can use another acronym. I tell my students to use SPIRE. Now, some other teachers use things like SPICES or Persia. I know some who use ESPN. But the point is to think of a broad range of categories to help you earn more points on the rubric. So if I want to answer this question, I can think of something social, political, ideological, or cultural, like if we're talking about religion or language, uh, regional or environmental, or even economic. And you will need to write multiple sentences. One sentence an explanation does not make. Usually there should be a because in your answer. 
If you're going to analyze how or why, that's the logical way of doing it. Now, this is a major pitfall for a lot of students. They sometimes start answering the question beautifully, and then, ugh, you just don't finish your thought. So, with a good start, you have my attention, but now you have to keep my attention. So, look at part C and choose one part of Spire to focus on. Let's choose ideological, and explain as you would to a small child. Now, some students may start off by saying that some countries, especially larger ones, may be diverse with multiple nationalities and cultures. Why? <laughs> well, because of processes like chain migration, where friends and family members will settle and concentrate in certain areas, so federal systems make more sense. Why? <laughs> Well, because subnational units can more effectively address local issues and provide a means for reducing conflicts between regions, resulting in greater national cohesion. Okay. So there you go. Make sure you finish the thought and answer all parts of the question. And notice how it connected ideological and political concepts. Also, notice what I did with the scale. Look at the stimuli. They show you states, so you know your analysis has to lead to the national scale. If you paid attention, my last words were resulting in greater national cohesion. Bingo. Now, explain may address a cause and effect relationship. So, remember, if you're going to be getting to the how and the why, that might be necessary. Okay, one more key aspect of explain. Looking at the CED again, you may see a task on an FRQ that asks you to explain the degree to which something has an effect. So there's that cause and effect relationship I was just talking about. So here's another question from a past AP exam, and you can see it's regarding my boy, Thomas Malthus. To answer this question, some students think only of positive correlations. Explain the degree does not necessarily mean you have to explain and agree. Aha! Now, you can agree if you want, but you could potentially explain how Malthus' theory would not be useful in predicting future population issues, especially in developed countries. Okay, I think I've explained explain enough. So on to the last task verb, compare. For this task, you would need to provide a description or explanation of similarities and or differences. Now, look carefully. Right there are the two previous task verbs, describe and explain. So you very well may see the word compare, or the task could require you to describe or explain. What? Similarities and or differences. To earn the point, both elements would need to be discussed in the written answer. And furthermore, be mindful. When it asks you to compare, read carefully, because you may need to compare and or contrast. Again, similarities and or differences. Now, I'm sure you've all heard the saying, comparing apples with oranges. Now, you need to talk about both things, okay? And you talk about how they are either similar or dissimilar. Now, how could this skill be used in this question? Well, here's a thought. Compare the role of the central government between unitary and federal states. So, clearly, you focus on the greater primacy and power of the central government in a unitary state. You could also see something like this. Explain one difference between the role of the central government in unitary states and the role of the central government in federal states. Both questions are not the same, and you could give different answers, but some responses could also be very similar to earn the point. Now, especially be aware of FRQ1 if there are visible differences between the two stimuli. Now, this wouldn't matter for these maps, but keeping up with current events, look at these. Both are maps of China at the same scale, but remember those what's different activity books when you were a youngin? Here, you're looking at levels of nitrogen dioxide, a gas released by burning fossil fuels. And you can see the difference before and after lockdown protocols. And a comparison would only be complete if you were to correctly reference both stimuli. Okay, we're almost done here, so let's briefly go back to the thinking skills from the CED. And here's a direct statement from the college board. Questions will present students with an authentic geographic situation or scenario and assess students' ability to describe, explain, and apply what? Geographic concepts, processes, or models. Notice skill category one. 
And then moving on, as they analyze geographic patterns, relationships, and outcomes in applied contexts. Skill category two. So what about the other skill categories? Well, you can expect to analyze quantitative data. Now that's information that can be recorded or measured using numbers. You can also expect to analyze qualitative information, which is non-numerical in nature. So this data comes from observations or interviews or things like that. You can also expect to analyze information across geographic scales to explain a spatial relationship. So just know that for any skill, you will likely need to directly utilize the stimulus. All right, so what are some common errors that we see as readers? So let's recap a bit. First off, never leave anything blank. Make an educated guess, okay? If you see something, you're not sure what to put down, relax and stay positive. Just know this, there are no trick questions. There's no gotcha questions. The FRQs are designed to make you think. And while at first something may seem kind of random, every task will be tied to the course content and a particular skill. And when the FRQs are designed, the multiple parts are not just random. They connect to each other in some way. Often, they can relate to each other in multiple ways. Just so you know, there is a method to the madness of the question creators. Okay, read carefully, especially if you are stuck. Reread the question. Determine which unit or units that the information can be from and think about the concepts from that unit. Some students misinterpret the stimuli, so study them carefully. Don't take forever analyzing them, but don't just rush through them either. Sometimes a stimulus or stimuli may show a change, and if it does, be sure to include that in your answer. And as I've said, some students fail to answer the question at the proper scale. You may be required to jump from one scale to another. So let's say from like local to national. So be mindful if you need to include analysis from multiple scales in your answer. Some students fail to answer fully. So be sure to include authentic real world examples and make sure your answers are not too vague or too simple or general. Avoid regional stereotypes that may not be too accurate. Also, use effective language. There are certain words that you should avoid, such as sweeping generalizations. Those are words like all, none, every, never. If there is one exception, your entire analysis is technically wrong. Instead, use phrases like often or most or the general pattern. Write precisely. Try to avoid nonspecific words such as lots of, things, or stuff. Now look, we get it. You may be using these words all the time in the vernacular with your friends, but they don't work well on an AP essay. Okay, so let me give you an example of something not to write. All Asians are smart and stuff. Survey says. Okay, hopefully you see this is not a good example. It has a sweeping generalization, it's incorrectly stereotypical, and extremely nonspecific. I mean, you got a trifecta right there. So again, avoid that at all cost. Also, think logically. Even if you haven't taken the course, how might you answer the question? Try to avoid unusual or exotic answers, exceptions to the rule. Remember, there are no tricks, so the answers they are looking for are usually fairly typical. Only use an exception if you are absolutely certain that it works. So let's finally wrap this thing up and reiterate what you need to do for AP quality preparation. This is what I tell my students is restaurant quality preparation. Now, I'm not talking about like your golden corral preparation. I mean five star quality. So look over the CED, know and understand the essential knowledge, the EKs, the geographic jargon. Be able to define all the terms in your own words and do not just memorize terms and definitions you must apply the concepts to the real world in multiple regions and at multiple scales. Use more than one source. You should obviously have your textbook and by now you should have an AP review book like this one here from AMSCO that I was fortunate enough to be a contributor. There's also some good apps out there that you can download. iScore 5 is a great one that I recommend. Don't forget about AP Classroom. There you can find sample FRQs and MCQs multiple choice questions. Now I know that there won't be any MCQs on the exam this year, but several questions have stimuli, so they can give you more practice. 
But we talking about practice, man. What are we talking about? Practice? We talking about practice, man. Also, there are a plethora of videos out there, man. While you're here, I'll gladly plug my YouTube channel. So feel free to subscribe if you like this sort of content. Remember to read the question carefully. Note the parts, the task verb, the scale, the data, and answer the question fully. Use the proper terminology. Think of mnemonic devices like Spire. Okay, often the question will specify. So for example, it might tell you to give political examples, okay, or economic examples. But this strategy helps nudge you into coming up with more accurate data so you can hit more parts of the rubric. Again, be mindful of the scale. You may be asked to change the scale of analysis. So look for a shift in scale in the question. For example, it goes from national to global. Now this should be obvious, but do not write in bullets. Bullets kill. Bullets will kill essays. So write in full, grammatically correct sentences. Make sure you're including full thoughts. So be as specific as you're confident with and as vague as you can get away with. So here's another thing. When you're looking at the question parts, you do not necessarily need to answer A first. Now you definitely need to label properly. So as in A, B, C order. But listen, if C is calling out to you, then answer that one first. Whichever part of the question seems most approachable to you, feel free to do that one first. So this builds confidence. It gets you writing and connects with your brain. Now, I presume that most of you will be typing your answers, and I strongly recommend that when you do so, you keep typing. So what I mean by that is don't go back if you have minor misspellings. So write down everything first, and then go back and refine it later. Now, unless we're talking about some egregious error, keep typing, keep moving along. This will allow you to continue that train of thought without interruption. On that note, practice timed writing on your own. Make it as game-like as possible. So organize your space, your environment. Again, place matters. Don't be going on taking your computer to some like, you know, godforsaken corner of your house where there's no Wi-Fi connection. Remember y'all, Failure to prepare is preparing to fail. All right, so let's finally finish off with a snide remark. So I have read thousands of essays over a number of years, and I've met hundreds of readers, teachers, professors, professionals. Now, these are amazing people, and trust me, each of them wants you to succeed. Just to set the record straight, we're not out to get you. We're not out to ruin your future. That said, you really need to do your part. So... Readers will work with you, but we won't write for you. So to clarify, readers score essays. We don't really grade essays. So what that means is that different readers will not score your essay differently. So what we do is we train the readers to become one with the rubric. So everybody is scoring exactly the same way. But as a reader, I need you to show me that you know what you're talking about. So keep writing until you finish your thought. Now, another thing, you do not lose points for wrong information. So readers do not deduct points from your overall score. Now, that said, wrong information certainly doesn't help your cause. So make sure that you take the time on the exam and make sure that you're putting forth the efforts before the exam to go ahead and get that five. So I hope you found this video helpful. Please give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Leave any comments if you want, and I will try to get back to you as quickly as humanly possible. Okay, y'all, from the bottom of my heart, have a day. All right, D-Snides out.